Hello and welcome to News Today on Joy News TV on Multi TV. My name is Matilda Nyakwa Kweku. In the headlines, about 60% of children between the ages of 10 and 15 are set to migrate annually from the Inquanta North District of the Volta region to urban areas to work as headquarters. And in international news, a blast at a bus depot on the outskirts of the Nigerian capital Abuja has killed at least 20 people during the morning rush hour. We have all these and more shortly. Security services in the eastern region have been urged to work extra hard and in a more professional manner to boost the public's confidence in the security service in the region. Eastern Regional Minister Julius Deborah, during a visit to the security services in the region, reminded the personnel of the need to be professional, competent and be firm in the discharge of their constitutional duties. Haruna Yusif Wumpuni reports. To have some respect for the human rights of people that we have to deal with and all that. It is very good, fantastic. I also encourage all of you to continue maintaining that level of cordiality between the police service and the civilians. But at the same time, you need to be very, very fair. I want to superintend it over a region where people see the police and they respect the institution. That doesn't mean that by the virtue of we respecting human rights and being very gentle to people and all that, if anybody at all acts in a very disrespectful manner to any police officer, we have to straighten it. We should change our mode of handling issues and assure the regional commander that if we all cooperate, I always want to use the three Cease cooperation, collaboration, and then coordination of all our efforts, then we will find this region uh, a peaceful region. So once again, I uh, want to assure the regional uh, minister that we are here to serve and we will serve uh, obediently and faithfully. A large size of 1.27 acres on GBLA Apadumi Road was allocated by the land, regional lands commission in the year 2007 to custom administration for the building of an office company. The compensation for the land was paid in January this year to the land owners through the regional lands commission. The lease documents are yet to be obtained from the regional lands commission to enable custom to take possession of the land. Now, the new patriotic party has ended its 16th national delegates conference in Tamale, in the northern regional capital. Over 1,000 police personnel and hundreds of military officers were deployed to maintain law and order before, during and after the conference. Now, we joined online by Chief Superintendent Habza Yakubu to talk to us about what has went on and what next. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. You are welcome. Okay, so what are your general assessment of how the security performed? Well, uh, I think uh, I must commend um, delegates as well as officials and supporters of the new patriotic party for uh, really uh, cooperating with the um, security arrangements that we set up I'm saying so because it all ended without any remarkable untoward incident reported. And so that is an indication that the security of Tamale. Okay, and we are told that you are still on the ground in Tamale. Can I know why? Yes, uh, normally in operations of such nat nature, we do not immediately pull out, uh, immediately uh, the event is done. What, what we need to do is to stay on the ground and uh, ensure that every single delegate has left the region. 
Now we are also considering the fact that uh, uh, prior to the events, there was a um, uh, reported unfortunate incident that uh, um, caused uh, injuries to some people. That is a that I was coming to that. Out. Yes. Yes. And so uh, since the matter is still being investigated, there is a need for us to also support our counterparts to ensure that uh, there is no issue of any threat. Then we can uh, pull out entirely. But do you have any Pulling leads to entirely. that? Um, I'm talking about in regards to the investigations. Have you come up with anything at the moment? Well, uh, I, I am not... Um, uh, in a position to give so much details, except that I'm aware we've gotten some leads and the investigators are following up on the leads that uh, they have received. And so we are still expecting that uh, people who know anything or suspect anything would be forthcoming to give us um, information that would help us successfully investigate the issue. Okay, so uh, after the Congress, uh, we have the Easter festivities. Will your presence still be felt in Tamale? Yeah, I mean, we have contingency plans for the Easter, and so those are also being implemented. But what are those we contingency have, plans? Well, it's basically to provide security. We are going to intensify our patrols. For instance, uh, in the Kwawu Ridge, where we know there are. Um, events that uh, uh, borders on international participation, we are going to beef up our presence in those areas. And then uh, as well within towns and cities, we are surely going to make sure that extra security is provided to enable people to enjoy their Easter. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have been speaking to Chief Superintendent Hamsa Yakubu to tell us um, what the police is still doing in Tamale with regards to security um, because of the Congress that the NPP had. Now, about 60% of children between the ages of 10 and 15 years are said to migrate annually from the Inquanto North District of the Volta region to urban areas to work as headquarters. The trend is being fueled by the prevailing poverty situation in the area. Komladu has more. The Inquantanos district, one of the 28 districts created in 2008, is strategically located between two major trading centers, Hohoi and Yendi. But in spite of its strategic location, household income in the district is very low. As a result, children below 15 years are said to be migrating to urban centers in search of work, mostly as headquarters to support their families. This means they are missing out on a chance to be educated while contributing to an increase in child labor cases. District Chief Executive for Nkwanta North, Martin Kudo, is thus appealing for help to deal with the situation. Speaking at the launch of a non-profit organization, Tikman Foundation, the DCE called for help in the area of education and vocational training to stem the tide of migration. Executive Director of Tikman Foundation, Samuel Wasa, whose organization will be training some 200 youth in the district annually, expressed the hope that the intervention will bring about a change in the district. According to him, the foundation has also acquired a 200-acre land that will soon be developed into a permanent school complex. He nonetheless called on other benevolent organizations to join in empowering the youth of the area. We want to bring out the youth that have been traveling far away from here to uh, Accra looking for a job and there's no job opportunity. We are going to bring this foundation here so that they can also acquire the knowledge, skill that they need, the talent that they need, them, that is hidden the thought they cannot do anything. We are coming to bring out those talents out of them so in the future they can also do some services. Comlado's report for Joy News. Organized and widespread theft of electricity continues to be a long-standing problem, crippling the efforts of the electricity company of Ghana, despite the deployment of its prepaid metering system. 
ECG, in the last three and a half years identified 9,537 illegal electricity connections across the country. In 2011, the company detected 2,929 illegal connections and was able to recover over 5.6 million Ghana CDs as revenue to the state. In 2012, the power utility company identified 3,425 illegal connections, out of which over 9, Ghana, 9 million Ghana CDs in revenue was recovered in 2013. 2,242 were identified out of which 11.8 million Ghana CDs revenue was recovered by the state. Now, as of March 2014, ECG had detected 941 illegal connections covering 3.3 million Ghana CDs. We are joined online by an economist, Ebenezer Baden, to deliberate on the matter. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Baden. Hello. Mr. Good Baden, afternoon. good afternoon and thank you for joining us on Join News TV. You have the report I just read. Uh, how do we nip this in the bud? Come again. I, I'm, I'm asking that the country is, is losing so much revenue to illegal connections. Yeah. How yeah. do we nip this in the bud? How are we going to get rid of this problem? Um, Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. But, You're welcome. Uh, from, from the script you read, you realize that a lot is being done to address uh, illegal connections and for that matter, some losses. Um, now, today, we have very sophisticated systems, smart prepayment metering, which can capture every load on, on, of the customer. We have automated meter reading systems deployed to accurately measure uh, consumptions of customers and then bill appropriately. Now, through this pr process, customers who cleverly uh, engage in illegal connections and all that, and then even conceal it, we're able to expose them and then bill them accordingly. Now, to support this effort, we've also had the AG's office uh, uh, supporting ECG to set up what we call the ECG or the utility court which we are using to prosecute all customers and our employees who condone illegal connections. Now, through this process, we've been able to make a lot of gains. Now, we've been able to uh, reduce losses by over 4 to 5%, and that is very huge in the industry. Okay. So this is, this is, these are efforts in place to make sure that we, are, we curb illegal connections and then uh, system losses. Okay, so um, let's talk about slums. What measures are you taking to solve the problem in the slums? Because I know it's not easy as compared to other areas. How are you going to go about fighting yes. this? You know, the, the automated meter reading systems, coupled with a smart uh, prepaid meter, will be able to see remotely whatever the customer is doing or the customer's consumption. Uh, assuming we read meters, uh, let's say, monthly, uh, through the remote systems, and then you realize that there is a dip in the customer's consumption for one month. Okay. That is enough concern for you to go and check what is happening on the ground. We have also introduced a means of re a project to rewire these locations. Uh, if you look at the Tishi area, which we've, we've combined a uh, prepayment between with system improvement, network improvement uh, project. What this does is that we, as we rewire the area, we also put in complex and then uh, more clever metering systems that will help uncover theft. Okay, so, so uh, how, far have you, how far have you gone with replacing the old meters with the new ones? Uh, we, but there are a number of separate projects running. Today we're talking of Ashanti region, which uh, in times past hasn't benefited from any major prepayment metering system. Today we have two separate projects, one uh, being supported by the World Bank, and then the other one is ECG's internally generated fund. To uh, replace all meters in the, the Ashanti region uh, with smart prepaid meters. Now, this will also be coupled with the automated meter reading systems, which will mm -hmm. bring in the remote uh, reading mechanism. Okay, so let's talk about the, those who have been prosecuted in relation to this issue. Can you give me some statistics? 
I mean, I, mean, I would like to know how many people have been prosecuted so far and um, what you're I doing. don't have the numbers readily available, but if you follow, there are a lot of publications, uh, publications on this. What we are trying to do is to come out with numbers and then on a case-by-case -case, uh, situation, like companies that are, uh, we uncover, we bring them out. After they are prosecuted, we publish in the papers for our customers and then the public to be aware of. So the utility costs are running, and then uh, the results that come from there, those are the summaries you read uh, yeah, this afternoon. Okay, but there doesn't seem to be enough deterrent. You know, what people are saying or suggesting that some of the ECG um, workers are actually collaborating with these people who are stealing uh, there. It is, it is largely true, and what the utility court is doing is to prosecute also our customers. Mm. Uh, our employees. Okay. So whoever is found within, in addition to uh, firing such a one, uh, person, we prosecute him and recover such funds that have been lost to, to the company. But so we don't. It's a two way, so a uh, two edged sword we're using to address uh, system losses. Okay. But I think that in order to get more people to own up, you need to encourage the customers. That is the ordinary Ghanaians. Uh, how are you encouraging them to come out? Yes, and um, what we are doing also is we have set up a, a reward scheme for okay. our customers who, for example, know others who are engaged in illegal connections. Now, when we go through the billing and everything, whatever is recovered, we give 7% of that much to the, the informant. So this, we handle it very confidentially. You, once you inform us this person has done illegal connections, we go through it, we uncover, we prosecute such people, and then whatever is recovered, we pay 7% to the informant. Oh. So this is a way of appealing to our customers to make sure that we, we, we clean up our system of illegal connection and theft. So um, how effective is the collaboration between uh, the ECG and the security to keep, uh, nip this in the bud? You know, the utility courts have prosecuted. We trained them because it, it, it was a matter of explaining the engineering mechanisms to them in court. Mm -hmm. Now, once you're able to uncover a legal connection, uh, let's say the, the, the live wire is moved from one point to another, you say this is illegal, it's a direct connection. We needed to explain this to the, uh, the judges and the magistrates for them to understand how these things, uh, what it means to us. And, uh, and why that leads to revenue losses. So through this training, we're able to get prosecutors and all that to come in, and then once we uncover, we take evidence, and then we get them remanded, and then we start the court, court proceeding. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Mr. Beneza Baden, he is an energy economist with the ECG. We take a short break. Don't go. I am Asamoah Jan, captain of the Black Stars. My name is Andre Dedeayu, player of the Black Stars. I pledge, I pledge to protect the goal. Practice safe sex. Always use a condom. Reduce your sexual partners. Know your HIV status. I pledge to protect the goal. Protect the goal. Came to a standstill. Police in a brief closing on criminal. Tonight, Ghana's cabinet completes review of a the property rights of staff. The campaign against current affairs. It is not unusual. It's a certain anticlimactic. Judges, Supreme Court judges have the duty. Protect the old life as it happens. Filing the petition by his opponent. Would expect that the area would be cordoned off. David Moyes managed to put in Rooney.
Now, the appetite for imported chicken among Ghanaians is still high as consumers contend they are cheaper and weightier. Some consumers, however, admit the local broiler birds are nutritious and they would have consumed more of them if they are produced in abundance. The preference of poultry consumers for imported products only reflects the challenges in the local poultry industry. A number of Ghanaians now consume imported frozen chicken regardless of its nutritional content or its origin. Dealers say, although there is market for the imported chicken, which is considered cheaper than the fresh local ones, they are no longer cheap. Imported chicken, I say, Consumers also say they will consume local poultry if farmers produce more to meet the demand. I prefer imported one. say, yeah, 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 Government's expenditure on poultry imports remains high to the tune of approximately $270 million in 2013 alone. But for some consumers, it will be prudent for government to rather spend on boosting the local poultry industry as the imported chicken is not healthy. <laughs> Consumers will have the options of imported and local poultry for now, but for poultry farmers, a broiler revitalization project which will see the production of over 60,000 tons of poultry will help bridge the current production gap. Abigail Adumakwenchi for Joy News. Minister of Trade and Industry Haruna Idrisu has indicated that Ghana has no choice but to sign the controversial economic partnership agreement with the European Union. Speaking on Joy FM and Joy News on Multi TV's current affairs program, News File Saturday, Haruna Idrisu noted signing the partnership would challenge Ghana to build its competitiveness, increase the capacity of local industries, and increase export to take advantage of the opportunity. A Ghana pack with EU and the regional pack. We are now saying that the ECOWAS region is negotiating a pact with the EU. 
which is far better than what Ghana initialed in 2007. So it is even in Ghana's interest to go with the original position if that is conclusive. What we have a challenge as mm. a country to wake up that mm. I concede to build your competitiveness, to build the capacity of your private sector and your industry, to equally take advantage of the open doors into the EU market by increasing your exports. We've launched a national export strategy which is seeking to up our exports from 2.3 billion to 5 billion. Mm. Take advantage of it and enter. Two, diversify the direction of your exports, which we will do as government. But you don't achieve that in a day. Now, crude oil prices have risen amid continuing tensions in Ukraine and concerns about possible disruptions to Russian gas supplies. The price of Brent crude futures rose above $108 a barrel in Monday trading, a gain of 0.8% on Friday's close. Pro-Russian militants are still occupying buildings in eastern Ukraine, ignoring a deadline to leave by Kiev. EU foreign ministers are meeting to discuss further sanctions against Russia. Brent crude oil was trading at $108.99 a barrel at 0900 BST, up 86% or 0.8%, while West Texas intermediate crude was trading at $0.4.52, up 93 cents or 0.9%. The European Central Bank ECB has said it will provide further stimulus to the Eurozone economy if inflation in the bloc continues to remain low. President of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, said a stronger euro will act as a trigger to lose a monetary policy. The rise of the single currency's exchange rate is one of the main reasons Eurozone inflation is at a dangerously low 0.5%. One of his stimulus options will be quantitative easing, QE. This is something the International Monetary Fund has been suggesting as concerns grow about deflation in the Eurozone. We're taking a short break. We'll be back with more. This is still Joy News today. Now, old fridges out, new ones in. And that seems to be the message the Environmental Protection Agency is conveying today as it continues a series of programs aimed at ridding of imported fridges from the country. Joy News reporter Matilda Wemega is online with an update of this. Good afternoon, Matilda. Good afternoon, Matilda. Now, Tilly, can you give us an update of what is happening so far? Hello. Hello, Matilda. Now, unfortunately, uh, we've lost her. We'll take sports, and then after that, if we get her online, we'll come back to the issue. Now, in sports, Filipino Manny Pacquiao has defeated American Timothy Bradley on points to win the WBO welterweight title in Las Vegas. Pacquiao, 35, who lost to Bradley in a controversial encounter in 2012, was the winner on all three judges' scorecards. The MGM Grand in Las Vegas was the venue for the ultimate grudge match as Timothy Bradley faced off with Manny Pacquiao for the WBO welterweight world title. Their previous meeting had ended in acrimony as Bradley beat the eight-time world champion Pacquiao on a split decision on points. Many believed it was the Filipino who'd won the bout. The calls for a rematch were answered and it drew a massive crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! When the fight got underway, the boxers tested each other with a flurry of punches in an opening round that went by in a flash as there was little to separate the pugilists. The second round saw Pacquiao come out the aggressor as he found his rhythm. He landed some clean shots, but nothing that really troubled Bradley. But the 35-year-old former champion looked in good shape as he took on the man five years his junior. 
American Bradley came out slugging in the fifth round as he looked to gain a foothold in the bout. And he landed a couple of solid right hands that staggered the Pac-Man. But Pacquiao has shown over the course of his career that he can take a punch. After a few more close rounds, Pacquiao then showed his pedigree. A flurry of blows had Bradley on the ropes. The sixth and seventh rounds saw the current champion take cover as he protected himself from a Pacquiao onslaught. The twelfth round and the end of the fight was the perfect finish to a highly entertaining bout as the boxers threw everything they had at each other. There was no killer blow as they both landed clean strikes to end the spectacle and this one went to the judges to decide who would be king. All three judges have it for the winner by unanimous decision from Serengani Province, Philippines, the new WBO welterweight champion of the world, Manny Pac-Man. And on Saturday, Arsenal beat Wigan to make it to the FA Cup Finals. So away from sports, earlier we were trying to talk to Matilda Wemega, who is at the dismantling site with the EPA. You know, and we want her to give us an update of what is happening currently. Uh, Matilda. Hello, Tilly. Uh, what exactly is happening? Well, as I was telling you earlier, that uh, uh, the Tema Port, the Ghana Port, Ghana Port Authority, has confiscated over 45 containers, which in all has 5,000 second-hand fridges in it. And these have been brought to the Afiena dismantling site, where these fridges have now been segregated, and they are going to be dismantled and then destroyed. Okay, so you are currently with the uh, Energy Commission? Yes, with the Energy Commission, in, yes. And uh, how many fridges so far? So far... From the port, they have been able to confiscate over 5,000 second-hand fridges. Wow. Yes, so uh, currently at the site, these fridges have been brought in, and then the workers here are trying to segregate them according to their rates, and then from there, these will be destroyed. Okay, and uh, do we have some of the owners coming around? No, these, you know, these were brought in by the importers. So according to the okay. Energy and Petroleum Ministry, as well as the Ministry of Environment, Science and Innovation, these importers will be severely dealt with. Mm. Because initially when these, uh, when these were brought in, they were declared as personal assets. But after investigation, these were identified as second-hand fridges. So from here... Uh, we are made to understand that uh, they would be coordinating with other stakeholders, with the Attorney General, so that these importers will be dealt with. Yes. But so that, great, hello? Yeah, they, they will deal with them, but what about preventing it? Have you found out? About? Preventing it from coming in, because I'm sure this is not new to them. Exactly. They are saying that uh, it's not just the, the port where they are keeping an eye on. They are keeping an eye at the other entry zone too as well. Because many a time, these, some of these could, the importers could be so smart that they might come in with it by lunch. So they are also putting effort at the other entry zone to ensure that these second-hand fridges do not find their way into the country. Okay, so that is the update you have for us so far. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Matilda. In other news, a blast at a bus depot on the outskirts of the Nigerian capital Abuja has killed at least 20 people during the morning rush hour. The blast happened as commuters were about to board buses and taxis to go to work in central Abuja. The blast occurred at the depot at Nyayan Bridge, around 8 kilometers south of Abuja. There was no immediate claim of responsibility, but suspicion is likely to fall on armed group Boko Haram. The group has been involved in increasing levels of violence in the northeast end.
Vote counting began in Guinea-Bissau after a heavy turnout in Sunday's legislative and presidential elections meant to bring stability to the West African state after years of coup and political infighting. No major incidents were reported by the close of polls. The Electoral Commission said turnout had reached 60 percent. Results are due by Friday. If no candidate wins an outright majority, a second round will be held between the top two. Sonny Ugo is a COAS Director of Communications. The spokesman for South Sudan National Army says President Salva Kerr government has no restrictions to purchase weapons from its international partners to protect lives and property as enshrined in the country's constitution. Colonel Philip Erger says the army will protect unarmed civilians in the country's conflict to enable officials of the government to continue with peace negotiations with rebels to resolve the crisis. His comments come after rebels allied to former Vice President Riek Mashar accused neighboring Egypt of providing military support to the government in Juba. They contend that Egypt military support could regionalize the conflict and exacerbate the crisis. The rebels say the government in Juba appears to be disinterested in the ongoing peace negotiations to resolve the conflict by seeking military support from Egypt. But Oga disagreed. Now we move from international news. Uh, you probably are familiar with the saying, a man must be fearful and ugly. Well, that was a perfect cliche excuse for men to have the liberty to be themselves without attracting curious questions. It could also be that unlike females, most men were not inducted into the art of grooming for, from an early age. So if all men wants to do is look presentable, why is he supposed to start? Marion Toure has been finding out about the beginning art of male grooming. Grooming used to be the preserve of women. We have our nails manicured and our toes pedicured and we trim our eyebrows and wear all the makeup just to look fabulous. But things have changed now and men are actually getting into the grooming groove, if you can call it that, with grooming salons like this, you know, springing up all across the capital. I am out here to find out how this phenomenon is catching up in Ghana and and what actually goes on behind the scenes in a men's grooming salon? Come on, let's go in and find out. In terms of uh, men's grooming, when the men come here, what do they usually want you to do for them? Oh, okay, some of them, the barbering and the, let me say, trimming, yeah, the trimming, barbering and the trimming, and some of them too. Uh, the sporting waves. It will make your hair nice. That's how it is. At times, too, we, uh, we offer pedicure and manicure and a lot of uh, our services. Erica Karimensa, who works with Elegant Men's Barbering Salon in Osu, says men have become more conscious about their looks. Men, especially those with high disposable income, tend to keep their regular appointments with them, a practice which hitherto was a preserve of women. Some people want us to design their eyebrows and remove some of the gray that is, yeah, some people, then the beard, to them we have this product. Uh -huh. Sometimes you apply the product before shaving, mm. which is very smooth. Okay, and you, it, you, you won't feel anything there, it, it won't bring out the bounce. We have towel warmer. With the, this is the towel warmer. And then the warmer, it can warm, then massaging their scars. And, uh -huh. and then aside that, after that, we have very nice products here that we do sell some here. You know, some can make the waves appear very nice and we have some pomade that we can apply in your hair that can make the hair become very dark too. 
Yeah. So that will be concealing grace as well. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wow. Exactly. Uh, but what is uh, your your clientele? The kind of people who come here? How, uh, oh, a lot. We have some of the ministers, the generals, and some the musicians to yeah and a very big man and the boys boys to sometimes they do come here yeah so it is for men who know what is up yeah a customer who prefers to remain anonymous shares his grooming regime with us how often do you visit uh, the salon as, as a man um once a week that's correct wow what, what services do you usually come for when you you come here um, besides the usual um, haircut, yeah, um, sometimes you come to shave, mm -hmm. you just come to groom yourself. And why would uh, a man now, you know, <coughs> want to groom themselves? Because we look at men who want to groom as very metrosexual. Um, what do you feel about that? Um, I'll say you're wrong. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think looking good is um, personal. Um, I don't think it's peculiar to be you being a man or being a woman, you know. Obviously, um, most guys, um, most guys are guys. They don't really care about how they look. But some of the guys, they really, they are particular about how they look, you know. And um, looking good, don't really have to uh, be particular to women. You get what I'm saying, right? Uh -huh. So it's a, it's a personal thing too. Yeah. And it makes you feel good at, at, at the end of the day? It depends on... It's like some guys, they want to be the man-man. Man. Uh -huh. okay. And um, why other guys? Yeah, you just want to be look good, presentation and all that. You know, depend on uh, most times um, what you do, who you are, what kind of, you know. So, yeah. So it's an entire persona? Exactly. With changing tastes, affluence, high disposable income, and perhaps modernization, many Ghanaian men are paying more attention to their look from head to toe. Marianne Toure, Joy News, Accra. And that is how we end news today. Let's look at stories that made headlines in the hour. About 60% of children between the ages of 10 and 15 years are said to migrate annually from the Quantanor district of the Volta region to urban areas to work as headquarters. And international news, we brought you a story about a blast at a bus depot on the outskirts of the Nigerian capital Abuja, which has killed at least 20 people during the morning rush hour. Thank you very much for watching. You've been with me, Matilda Nyakwa Kweku. Good afternoon.